Cuphead is kind of strange in the story department in that you can really look at it from many angles. The major one being, there really isn't much lore at all. It's just a fun cartoon style story where nothing happens in a specific order slash timeline or is connected. Everything that happens is its own contained episode. Nothing wrong with that. And that may be exactly what MDHR designed. But we keep getting hints at really cool ideas, like there is a history to the Cuphead world. There are little references, small moments with huge implications, and what seems to be a good degree of thought put into everything. So another angle you can look at it is from one of my perspective, where not everything has an answer, but MDHR put a lot of thought, time, and effort into creating amazing questions and leaving clues with room for batshit theories. If you don't like the idea of that, oh yeah, no thanks. that's okay. Cuphead's main draw after all is the art, music, and gameplay. But for me, and evidently a lot of other people, there is plenty of evocative story and lore to have discussions on. Take Mortimer Freeze, for example. Base level, he is a combination of many references. The theme of the fight is a direct reference to a Fleischer animation called Bimbo's Initiation. Damn, boy! Mortimer's design could have been partially inspired by the Ice King from Adventure Time, but probably more likely is inspired by the Winter Warlock from the old Santa Claus is Coming to Town. The snowflake finger licking is a reference to both the ghost in Swing Your Sinners as well as apparently the old man in the mountains. If you are looking at this game from the first angle, then that's about as far as you will go, just a ton of really cool references and easter eggs for a fun boss that apparently many people are underrating. Now let's look at it from a different perspective. What is the snow cult? Does it have any connections to other things in the game? And what's the deal with Mortimer Freeze? This particular boss fight is titled Snow Cult Scuffle. Now I'm gonna assume most people watching this know what a cult is, and if you don't, well then I would suggest getting Cult of the Lamb when it releases in August. Just kidding, sorry. A cult is basically a symbol of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object. So think like anime readers or the Undertale fandom. When you walk up to the ice palace where the fight takes place, you can hear an eerie sound, which I can't quite make out what it is. So if you guys have any ideas, let me know in the comments. The cult part of the fight is actually a huge deal and is multi-layered. Mortimer is obviously the leader, or at least the leader of the Snowman cult members. These guys, like most cult members, are pretty brainwashed and probably don't have that much usefulness. Originally, they might have been the ones to be formed into the Snowman for the second phase. As we can see in the teaser trailer, the Snowman phase has no audience. However, this teaser was released in July of 2019, so they probably just hadn't finished animating this fight. However, this teaser does give us a good look at two important aspects of the fight, mainly the symbols on the upper parts of the arena, as well as a look at the skybox. There will be heavy speculation from this point forward, and not everything will be perfectly backed up with evidence. Or might just be wrong, so I want your ideas on this as well, but we will have to take this one step at a time. If you approach the fight from the outside, it's daytime. The Inkwell Isles are always experiencing daytime in the overworld. In fact, up until this point, there are only three places where we see possible nighttime. The final phases of Hildeberg and Grim Matchstick, and the Phantom Express. The Phantom Express has some connection to the Astral Plane as we know, since ghosts are heavily connected to it and it takes place in a graveyard. That leaves just Grim Matchstick and Hilda Burt. But Grim's final phases don't technically happen at night, rather it just gets dark because of a storm and rain clouds. What about Hilda Burt? Hold that thought till a bit later. The first phase of Mortimer's fight is fairly simple, but the main thing we should focus on are the tarot cards. There are three in the fight, the sun, the moon, and the swords. The Sun Tarot card means good fortune, happiness, joy, and harmony. It represents the universe coming together and agreeing with your path and aiding forward movement into something greater. The Moon card represents illusion and deception, and therefore often suggests a time when something is not as it appears to be. The Three of Swords card depicts a fundamentally sorrowful experience. It's easy to understand the first two. Mortimer runs the cult and gets new members by offering promises of happiness and harmony. But this, of course, is an illusion, and Mortimer is deceiving people into joining. Perhaps the Three of Swords represents how the cult members will inevitably turn out? Note the moon symbols on the ceiling, as well as the middle image. Also hold this thought for later. In the second phase, we of course get the Snow Golem, who is lowered to the ground with chains. 
and in this phase he has an attack that can summon swords from the ground. Maybe the sword card is referencing this guy. Being a member of the cult could lead to you ending up like this snowman. Being chained up would be a fundamentally sorrowful experience in my opinion. In the end of the DLC, we do see the golem freed and happily fishing, so looks like things turned sun card for him in the end. Now we start getting into the heavy speculation territory. What is the cult about? We know Mortimer's the head, but cults can be either about worshipping the guy in charge, or the guy in charge leading the cult members in worship of something else. I think this is where the snowflake factors in. We can see the centerpiece of the ceiling is what could either be a snowflake or a frozen over sun or moon. What if the purpose of the cult is for Mortimer to become that? What if we are partaking in a ritual? Think about it, the first phase is the setup. Mortimer using a crystal ball and tarot cards to begin the process. The second phase is the sacrifice. Mortimer is absorbed into the body or host of the chained golem, who we then defeat. The golem is sacrificed Darth Maul style, sending Mortimer up into the atmosphere, past either of the moon symbols depending on what side the golem is when you beat it, and then when the snowflake appears it's in the center, aligned with whatever that frozen over object is in the arena. This final phase could be the ultimate goal of the cult, to have Mortimer either ascend into or fuse with this form. Unfortunately for Mortimer, we have other plans to defeat him, leaving him sick and shivering. Okay, so why does this happen? What is the point of the ritual? Here's where we get really crazy. So like I said, Hildeberg is the only fight at night besides this we haven't connected to the astral plane in any way. You start her boss fight at an observatory, which are generally used to study the celestial bodies and the stars. The moon is a celestial body. Hildeberg has the power to summon constellations or transform into what they represent and fight you. Constellations are made of stars and other planetary bodies. However, in her final phase, she doesn't use a constellation to transform, she just turns into a semi-crescent moon which does bear slight resemblance to the moon symbol in the Ice Palace, which also has a face, but it's not that similar. But then a bigger coincidence is her nose, which is very similar to that of the Snowflake. Unfortunately, that's where it starts getting a little bit too stretchy for me to make connections. I feel like I'm on the right track though. We know the symbol of an eye is connected to the astral plane, with both the broken relic as well as the Jimmy's Pyramid attack using an eye to interact with the astral plane. I have a feeling that the snowflake's eyeball attack could factor into this some way, but any connections I try to make are, if I'm being honest with myself, very weak. Maybe reaching the snowflake form is a way to get control over part of the astral plane. The ingredient in this fight is needed to craft the wonder tart after all, and the wonder tart gives you full control over the astral plane, which is Saltbaker's main goal. We know stars and celestial bodies are connected with the astral plane, so Hildeberg being in an observatory as well as turning into a moon under the night sky, this snow cult ritual involving the moon and the night sky. Either there is something here to find, or I will waste away my life on a useless conspiracy theory that holds no truth. But MDHR is known for not cutting corners. It's kind of their thing. The reason new content takes so long. So why do we keep seeing reoccurring thing? What's the deal with Funhouse Frazzle? Or the background in Mangosteen's arena? And how the fuck does Beppy the Clown tie into all of this? That's what I'm currently working on. What do you guys think? Is there a direct or indirect connection between Hildeberg and the Snow Cult? What's the whale's deal? Other than being a reference to Pinocchio, I'm not sure. It's the same color and has the same star pattern as the crystal ball table that Mortimer summons tarot cards with. But the whale is fine in the end of the DLC, getting a nice toothbrushing from Saltbaker. The only astral plane connection I could find doing research was something called an astral leviathan, which takes the form of a whale. But that was from D&D, which is another type of cult, so we can't really take that. Space whales are a pretty common thing among a lot of media though. But then again, we see this guy just chilling in the waters near Equal Isle 4, so I don't know. This could be one of those moments where MBHR wanted to add a whale to the fight, and so they added a whale, and a whale is a whale. But I don't know. I guess one other thing to note about the fight is the icy sugar cubes. We see the bucket they are held in multiple times in the fight. It's a symbol on the wall in the arena and on the tower on the outside. The snow golem is wearing it, and we see it fall once Mortimer gets blasted into the atmosphere. It's also a parable object in the final phase. The cult members are also wearing this bucket as a sort of uniform. In the Saltbaker fight, the sugar cubes are represented by this unfortunate fellow, so there isn't really a connection there. Although it is cool that they incorporated the ingredient you are trying to get into the actual fight as much as it is. An interesting side note is that after the Mortimer fight, he still seems pretty evil, or at least devious, as a cult leader would be. The more I kind of dig into and speculate about these different Cuphead bosses, the more cool things I discover. I am really enjoying making these types of videos, so you can expect more, at least on the DLC bosses in the future. 
I know this video probably asked more questions than it answered, but getting this stuff out there to as many people as possible will widen the discussion, and then hopefully someday I will be able to tie it all up in like an hour long video on Cuphead lore or something. If you enjoy this type of video, then subscribe, because there will be more. Also, hit the like button. Apparently YouTube gets pleasure out of it, I don't know.